Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, tuning in tonight. Welcome to the program. This is Politics Today, and I'm Sean Wakimaloe here in Abuja. So much to talk about tonight, because from yesterday, after the barrier uh, of those soldiers gruesomely killed in Delta State, there's been some more information coming in as to what happened, what the military is doing, what they're looking at, and the effort in apprehending those who are behind these uh, dastardly act uh, in the Okwama community of Delta State. But tonight we'll be getting some more insight and perspectives uh, from those who are on the ground, especially those who are leaders of thought in that area. And also we'll be dissecting President Balatinobu's uh, establishment of the Presidential Economic Coordination Council. What does this mean? We'll be getting so much more on the program tonight. So stick around with me. But first and foremost, let's serve you with some of your political roundup stories. All right, then um, we will be bringing to you uh, the political roundup just in a moment. We'll be getting that to you. Um, let's tell you, first and foremost, about the intentions and what the president, Bola Tinubu, has done. He's a, a established uh, what is now called the Presidential Economic Coordination Council, which comprised himself uh, as uh, uh, the chair and the vice president, Senate president, and its chairman of the Nigerian Governors Forum, among 27 others. The president says that the move is in furtherance of his administration's efforts at re-engineering the nation's economic governance framework. The PECC also comprises members of the organized private sector who would serve for one year. And so you will be... Uh, looking at some of the names of those who are involved. So this is, these are the three major teams, the Presidential Economic Coordination Council, the Economic Management Team, and Emergency Tax Force, the Economic Management Team. These are the three subgroups, which, of course, the president is the chair of all of them. But if you look at the Presidential Economic Coordination Council, which has um, uh, uh, most of them uh, the, in the team, the ministers in the federal cabinet, and there is the private sector wing or private sector members. Uh, and one thing that really uh, probably caught my eyes is the fact that uh, out of the, the team are some young Nigerians in the private sector, uh, the likes of Chidi Ajayre, uh, young persons in the manufacturing and in the uh, uh, private sector, which, which is very interesting also as the dynamics and the, the likes of uh, uh, Funke Opeke, uh, uh, women who are doing very well on the run outside, the likes of Aliko Dangote, Tony Alumelu, Abdul Samad Rabiu, and the rest of them. Well, let's get some insight uh, into this formation, uh, which perhaps uh, the 19 other persons uh, to serve on the economy management team, emergency tax force, which was approved by the Federal Executive Council on Monday. Let's get some perspectives and look at how this will in any way impact on our economy. I'm being joined tonight by, the, by a professor of political economics, uh, Professor Patu Tommy, who joins us live from Lagos. All right, we'll be getting to Professor Otomi just in a moment. Um, he's going to be joining us from Lagos. But let's also give you some perspective on one of our discussions for tonight, which is about uh, the, those who have been declared wanted by the Nigerian military, eight of them. Let me allow you to see the faces of those. Well, the the uh, defense headquarters today says they will be needing the help of Nigerians to finding them, and these people will be very crucial to clues as to those who killed uh, the, uh, police, I mean, the, 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 the military officers in the Okwama community of Delta State. Take a listen to the DHQ spokesperson. We must never allow what happened in Delta State that resulted in the killing of 17 soldiers that were buried yesterday to ever repeat itself in this country again. We must never allow it to happen again. When you look at our armed forces, our armed forces is a force for good. 
we are deployed across the country for a reason. And it is for that reason that we have put out this banner of eight persons, including a woman, as wanted persons. We will do whatever it takes to get these people. If we need to put a bounty on their head, we will do that. All right, you heard the spokesperson of uh, the defense headquarters. Now, let's get some perspectives to leaders in the community who perhaps have perspectives on what exactly is going on. Maybe they can also identify for us those uh, whom we can see their faces in uh, the, those pictures that as displayed by uh, the, uh, the military today. Let's speak with an Yorubo leader and... Uh, 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 former editor of the Guardian newspaper, Mr. Abraham Ogodo. Thank you so much indeed. And it's good to see you after a long time. <laughs> Thank you, Shimon. Thank you so much. Um, sad news, especially when the bodies of those slain soldiers were being lowered yesterday, brought a lot of emotions and one couldn't control it for those uh, soldiers who were said to be uh, on a peace mission in that community and they were gruesomely murdered. What are you learning as a leader of thought in that area? Yes, um, I have said before that uh, there is so much to learn. Uh, what has been in the news is the narrative that uh, the soldiers went on a peace mission and they were killed. For whatever reason, nothing calls for that kind of killing of soldiers, for whatever reason, whether they were on peace mission, whether they were on a conventional patrol, whatever reason, no military officer, no officer, no soldier of the Nigerian army would be killed that way. And so it was most unfortunate. But that is uh, what has been said. Uh, my surprise is that uh, we keep pushing that narrative. And for the reason I can't understand, the chief of defense staff, General Christopher Musa, came all out to say it clearly that, of course, the military, the army, uh, knows how those soldiers were killed and who was behind the killing, and that they were closing in on the suspect. Then, yesterday, during the barrier, the president gave a different, uh, from his speech, they were still holding on to the point that, yes, they were killed by youths or persons in the Koma community when they went on a peace mission. It is beginning to look like a display of cross purposes. That shouldn't happen. Let's hold on to a narrative. Uh, we have said before that um, that level of tragedy, that kind of thing couldn't have happened from just a peace mission. As so much is underlying it. And that much was also confirmed by the Army High Command. The topmost person in the military, in the Army, that is the Chief of Defense Staff. So I, I wouldn't understand why there should be a counter-narrative even alongside that. So give us the narrative from the people's point of view. If the military has a narrative, if the government has a narrative, you as a leader of thought within that area, give us what exactly is the true picture of things. Was there a peace mission from the information and knowledge that you have? The background was such that... Uh, peace mission, there was a kind of misunderstanding between two communities, Okoloba and Okwama. Okoloba being an Ijo community, and then Okwama being an Orobo community. But it is not so much about the ethnic division. These communities are intertwined. They are so integrated in so many ways. In, in, in tradition, in marriages, in so many ways, they are um, integrated. And if there is any kind of dispute, it's something that can be handled. But this time, maybe the level was a bit 
uh, above the ordinary. And the, uh, the, 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 the story is that the Delta State government actually went into it. it was, it was, uh, the Delta State government was on top of it. Meetings were called. Uh, our calls were assigned. And everything was okay. Then the next we had was that um, military officers and men went to the place on a peace mission. Who invited them for that peace mission has not been clearly stated. Was it the leadership of the community? Was it the, le the political leadership? That is the leadership of the local government. The two communities spread between two local governments, Bumadi local government and Ugeli South local government. Are we talking of the leadership of the local government that invited them for that peace mission? Are we talking of the community leaders that invited them for that peace mission? All of that has not been established. But, but uh, what, what can we establish? Uh, that those who say this was not about land dispute. No. Uh, that this was maybe about oil, illegal oil bunkering and some of the tussle between these communities about a whole lot of talk relating to oil. Is that true? It's very true. It's very true. Nothing, nothing so grave happens in the Niger Delta without oil underlining it. That has been said before. And that has also been confirmed by the chief of army staff. When we are looking, fishing for other facts is what I don't understand. Let's keep that narrative. What will happen is that whoever is accessory in any way to the killing, if investigation brings that person out, fine. Nobody is going to query that. Nobody is going to raise issues. Mm -hmm. regarding but Mr. Obodo, what are the facts on the ground as the community knows it now? What are the facts? Because the community seems to have their own fact, and what they do know uh, is against the fact that those who believe that uh, if there are conflict between two communities, Okoloba on one hand, Okoma on one hand, that those who think in that community that why is the pressure on Okoma community? What exactly was the reason why the Okoma people believe that there was too much of pressure and there was a side taking against them? Yes, because uh, what we hear and what everybody says is that use of Okoma community killed the soldiers. And the Okoma community, they are not even in the stead. As we talk today, the community does not exist. What do you mean? In time exist. and space. Of course, the, the military has taken over the community. We don't even know where the people are. Nobody reaches the leaders. They have all gone underground. And so they are not even able to present their own story. They have not said anything. What we are running with is a single narrative, as told by the army, the military authority. Is it true that the youths, uh, rampaging youths of the community, killed the soldiers? That is the issue for determination. And that is why the president set up an investigation team. And no investigation has been done. That has not been established. And so to come to that conclusion, it's just judicial. Mm, but th there, are, there are some key elements, uh, some key personalities yes. who are so-called the big boys, which you know some of the facts that have been thrown around the, co the conversation and narrative within the Yoruba community and the Ijo community about these personalities, some of them who have been in government before and some of them who are deeply involved in oil refining and uh, illegal bunkering and all what have you. And these are some of the facts that could help the nation to be able to know where exactly we are headed. What can you tell us? What exactly are the grievances or the conflict? What was the bottom line of the conflict? So if all of this is known to the authorities, why are they not just doing that? Can you tell us? That's why you are here. Yes. So let us know what the facts that are not out there, what we do not know. That's why you're here. What we do not know, the facts that are not out is that it is not true that those gallant officers would have been taken out by just community boys. As so much to it. And the, the story is that they were not just only killed, their bodies were mutilated. And so there was some kind of anger. What kind of a, 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 an attempt to just pull out something, to get even with some grievance, 
And so it's deeper than community. I said in one forum that that community, as we know it, is just a rural community, does not have the capacity to deliver that level of tragedy. And when the, when the, when the president said this thing was going to be investigated, we were all happy. But the military is pushing against every other view and maintaining that persons from Okoma killed those soldiers. Maybe because they were killed on Okoma soil. Well, the, 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 the thing is this. The Okoma community is on the bank of the Fokados River. So also is the uh, Okoloba community. The bodies were discovered uh, uh, maybe downstream uh, the, 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 the uh, Fokados River. We will not, I will not be able to say whether they were killed there. Anybody could have killed anybody anywhere. That is the truth. But I'm saying that the way the officers got there, the way they were taken out, it's not something that sits well with, uh, with some community arrangement. Mr. Because, Gordon, you, you, did, did, did you see a video by a young man who said his father was a retired soldier? And that uh, uh, he was, he, he could be. I mean, I think maybe his face. Uh, no, no, the, no. The military are looking for information. Yes. From that, if you bring back those pictures, what can you tell us about some of these personalities that are here on that picture that you can see? I don't even know too many of them, but uh, at least uh, I, I know, I know, I know two of them. The the, the king of uh, the kingdom and uh, maybe the president general. Uh, Otherwise, the other ones, I don't know. The young man you're talking of, a video, uh, 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 a video that was trending about uh, uh, the young man saying who killed the people. You see, they, 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 since the incident, there have been a lot of theories, a lot of conspiracies. Anybody could create anything, which is why we should give every chance for that investigation to be done properly. And the military is not to do that investigation. Who should do it? Of course, the military does not do investigation. The police is there. The DSS is there. The mil in any case, the military is the one that is injured. And I have always said that if we don't do a few things about the way we engage the military, we are not going to get out of this so soon. The military is an institution created by law. And the military, there is no law that sets up the military that also says that if the military suffers an injury, it is within the military to seek remedy. It's not done that way. And so the military must find some ways to say, oh, we are injured. And the injury is presented to appropriate authority to carry on. So I, how, how do you hope, uh, how, how will you suppose that the federal government should handle the investigation? The investigation should be handled by independent persons, independent uh, institutions. The police is there. The DSS, the secret police is there. We, we have other agencies that can do it. There should be a collaboration between this. But the military, we, nobody can even enter the place. The governor was not able to access the place. Why? Because the military took over? Yeah, the military said uh, the governor could not enter because the place was not safe for him to enter. And as we talk, I, we, they made it look like, oh, the, something could happen in a crossfire. Is there a real crossfire in Okoma? No crossfire now. It's just a single fire now. Is the military that is firing? Is that the other side that is returning fire against the military? The answer is no. So the military, uh, the, the community has been sacked at the moment. It's sacked. But how would you be able to, I mean, know this? Because uh, you said that there uh, no access to the community. Because we, we are not able to get there. We are not able to talk to anybody. And nothing is happening there. Nobody can get there. Nobody can get there. I mean, and the, the, the video that came out was the video of a community in flame. And so how do we get there to confirm that the military is that we didn't do it? What is your biggest fear, Mr. Gwedo, in all of this scenario playing out? My biggest fear actually is nothing should be done to punish anybody that is innocent. In fact, there is something in jurisprudence that it's better to allow a thousand criminals to go away 
than to punish an innocent person. Nobody has any problem apprehending the culprit and making them face the full weight of the law. So you implying that the people who have probably carried out this Daphne Act must have been people who are heavily armed. You are inferring that this might be militants who are heavily armed and that no, no ordinary youth of Okuama could have done this. Is that what you are saying? I think it couldn't have been said better than what the chief of uh, defense staff said. He said it on national television and everybody heard him. That they know who did it. See, we are talking of all commissioned officers of the Nigerian army. And then the rank and file going for a mission. And they were taken out like that. They didn't have any form of cover. They were just taken out like that. Who actually invited them for that peace mission? Has that question been asked and answered? But, but does, that, does that, I mean, also give the reason to the gruesome murder, even if we that have, has not been answered? We have said we do back and over that. Nothing, nothing explains it. Nothing justifies it. Nothing justifies it. Unfortunately, they, they, they are not able to live to tell their own story. Yes. Because they were gruesomely taking out. Which is why the investigation should be total, so but, that lesson can be learned. Yeah, there because are, the military itself, yeah, it was said that 18 or so people went on yes, that mission, yes. but only one person returned. What insight do you have onto that? I don't have any insight into that. The thing we knew, or oh, so far, the thing we have been made to know is that... Uh, all military officers that went, we are taking out. But there is a... So a lot, uh, that also there, is... There is a, a civilian. That, that also good. That also is an angle. How come military men we are taking out? And a civilian had the ability to escape fire. Who is this civilian? I don't even know him. And so the military, they, because he is in now the prime, the prime witness, the person that has given mm -hmm. all the details, of how those military men were taken out. Questions will be asked that in a, in a conflict situation, mm. who is more equipped to, to maneuver his way? Is it the civilian or the, 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 the trainer? Uh, let, let, let's bring man. this conversation home. Mr. Oboro, yes. are you thinking in some way that there are some untouchables in this old narrative or in these old scenarios that their names or their personalities have not been identified here? Or publicly known? It, uh, it is for government to really say. Some people have uh, touched on it. I think uh, one uh, gentleman, a retired uh, military officer, to I think it's a commando, I don't know whether it's a Navy or Air Commando, or Laumi, who was, who really alluded to that, that uh, all of these will not be too far from the security arrangement about the, the how. Uh, oil access can be, can, be, can be secured in the region. And so the, it's, a, it's a whole range mm. for investigation. All right. And so the government has to really do it right. thoroughly so that we don't come back to it. Mr. Uh, Abraham Obodo is a former editor of the Guardian newspaper and an Eurobo leader. Thank you so much indeed for your time tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. We we'll take a break, everyone. But when we return, Professor Pat Utomi, uh, a political economics, will be talking to us about President Bola Tinubu's uh, what we call an elite team put together to rescue the nation's economy. Would that work? We'll be hearing from Professor Utomi after this break, everyone. Come on, see. earlier about what President Bola Tinubu has said and done in terms of the, uh, the people, the couple of people he has put together to manage, advise, and execute economic policies in the country. Of course, he is the chair of that PECC now, and there are three layers of, of, of those uh, structure, uh, system that he has put together. Uh, part of it also uh, contains uh, uh, the, the role of the private sector players which, of course, I said earlier, we've seen some very vibrant women and some young persons also in that team. Of course, we'll be talking about the state of the nation and the economy and the way to go, uh, to go forward for Nigeria. You can see the Presidential Economic Coordination Council, the PECC, 
Economy Management Team, Emergency Task Force, the Economy Management Team, EMT, all of these put together. Of course, we'll be showing you some of the list of those persons. Let's speak with Professor Patu Tomi, who is live with us from uh, the Victoria Island area of uh, Lagos. Thank you so much, Prof, and it's good to see you again. Thank you. It's a uh, pleasure. Maybe before I take you into uh, national issues, let me take you, because I know that at some point you had some intervention uh, on the Labour Party and the ongoings, uh, the leadership issues. But are you happy with the manner in which things uh, ended uh, and perhaps those who are objecting to the emergence of Mr. Abure as a national chairman of the Labour Party? Uh, part of the tragedy of the Nigerian condition is that um, you wonder how we managed to come up with a generation that does not focus on the big picture, on the future, and somehow has managed to get consumed uh, with instant gratification, personal, uh, again, me, myself, and I, and somehow don't care whether the country goes anywhere. Uh, you would think that by being around and showing example, and they see you, they see that everything you do is sacrificial, that they would learn something. Uh, but some poison has been planted in Nigeria, I would dare say, uh, an obsession with money, power, and ego. Uh, and this is setting our country back so badly. And if you look at every political party, you see the same problems. Uh, and, and so I, I just I feel kind of uh, uh, down in spirit that these shenanigans would continue to go on, that instead of wanting a broad base to use to transform the country, people are acting in ways that can preserve personal privilege and prevent, actually, really truly prevent the country from making progress. It's a tragedy that this is the, the lot that we have. It's, it's part of the collapse of culture that mm. came with oil. I was listening to you and your last guest, uh, and that is the same reason all these things are happening. Uh, until the Nigerian elite comes to a certain understanding that there is a collapse of culture and that the country is dying because truly, truly values shape human progress and there has been a collapse of culture. Until we go through a certain moral rearmament, a certain revival of, you know, character. I'm, I'm sorry, Nigeria is not going anywhere. No, prof, I mean, uh, yeah. You, I do understand. Yeah. You, you, you wonder that your light... Mr. Peter Obi was not, you were not there at the national convention. Does that invalidate? There was, was there a national convention? There was one in Was in there a, a national we, convention? We saw Mr. Abure and some other leaders of the party there. What exactly is going on? Well, I, I think. Well, is there an okay. hijack of the party? <laughs> well, that's, that's the point I'm trying to make to you that hustling has replaced thinking. Uh, national interest you know, has been subverted by a me, myself, and I grab because power has been defined in Nigeria as an opportunity for state capture and use of public resources for the good of the individual. Uh, and look at where we are in everything we do. Look, look, Shem, uh, I, I am told that the IMF just put out a, a, a ranking of African countries by GDP, and Nigeria is not even in the top 10. It's just not on the list at all. And, and the elite of Nigeria can't sit down and say, what has happened to us? What have we done to ourselves? People are still carrying on looking for position, looking for power, looking for money. This money that has ruined everything, ruined us all. I don't know. I'm not sure that we're ready to make progress, quite frankly. And uh, so, uh, Prof, you know, you were, you were at the vanguard of uh, raising the hands of Mr. Peter Obi, preaching how Peter Obi could change Nigeria using the Labour Party platform. And I was asking the question, maybe you are not able to answer directly. The question is, is the Labour Party, or has the Labour Party been hijacked? Or what exactly is going on? Hijacked by who? I mean, like in all the political parties, 
characters are playing all kinds of games to prevent Nigeria from seeing the light. It's happening in every political party. And you see Nigeria falling and falling apart, but they don't care. They are so absorbed by self that they will do anything, exclude everybody, play any game, invent constitutions and all kinds of things. But I, I, like I said to you, we'll eventually find out whether there was a convention. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, if Nigerian people don't want to build a nation, what's the big problem? Let everybody go to his father's house. Let's walk away. Let's go and live in our small communities. We can survive without Nigeria, you know. Uh, but, but the elite of Nigeria are so narcissistic, are so destructive of the possibilities of progress in Nigeria that I have switched off. Quite frankly, Shew, I'll say to you before I came on, my gaze is at the continental level now. I'm not looking at Nigeria anymore because to look at Nigeria will be a heartbreaker and to just give yourself a heart attack. Let it drift to Somalia if that's where the people want to go. Um, you, you don't have a choice. Some of us will. Some of us, you are part Nigeria's part. No, I have a choice. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a as choice. far as some of us who I are your friends are concerned, you do not have a choice in this matter. <laughs> Nigeria will be great in our time, Prof, <laughs> and we will all play our roles, uh, Prof. Don't be tired. Uh, uh, and that's I what I, for that I'll, I'll get to a conversation. Fifty years of my life has been given for that. But look, hey, after all of it, what's there to show for it? Characters popping out from anywhere, trying to grab to things, not thinking about their own children. Oh, I want to get this. this. Where did they, they die? Nothing. Nothing to show for it. So let me so ask a you, Prof. Of SUVs. Yeah, yeah. Prof, uh, I'll, I'll take you to some of the proposition of a change of system of government. But uh, from your economic uh, knowledge, share with us tonight. The team that the president has put together... Uh, putting an elite team together uh, and the kind of the crop of people that we have and the segmentation, what do you make of it? Well, Shim, first of all, to be very honest with you, I don't have the information on the team, but it really doesn't matter. It's slightly more than about teams. Um, I've just written a book. I don't know if you've had a chance to read uh, my new book on... Uh, power politics, the public policy process, and performance. And you will see why repeatedly attempts at reform in Nigeria have not worked. You will see that ultimately there's a process thing. And there are, you know, political power games in players within the process. And the nature of how we manage those games are far more important than even the ideas that get put forward many times. Uh, Dr. Ngozi Okunjo Iwala, after turbocharged entry into the scene, ended up writing a book uh, about uh, reforming the unreformable. You know, the Nigeria story is about reforming the unreformable. The, the naked truth, if you look at our history, is why did we make progress between self-government coming 1957 and 1960? Why was it that colonial Nigeria deliberately failed to industrialize Nigeria, but the independence fathers in taking over by 1957 could go from a no industrialization Nigeria, perhaps two factories, in all of Nigeria in 1956, uh, Federal Motor Industries, I believe, and the uh, Nigerian breweries or whatever. And by 1960, manufacturing was 20% of GDP. Why is it that the agricultural revolution in Western Nigeria and Northern Nigeria and Eastern Nigeria took place in those early 60s? Uh, with the farm settlements and all of those. Why did all of those things happen dramatically, even without the kind of resources that we have now? Pastor Kibo will tell you uh, in the public philosophy of development in Nigeria about how the savings or reserves that were built up in London 
by the various regional um, marketing boards, how they were drawn down between 57 and 1960. And the industrial transformative outcome of that. Even a Chinese woman, Irene Son, who write about at the beginnings of industrialization, how in Kaduna in 1960, we got a factory set up by Hong Kong Chinese that broke even in one month and exported its first six months production, bought up by merchants in Manchester and England. What happened to that Nigeria? Why is it unable to produce today? It's not about lack of policies. It's not about uh, uh, who is in the economic management team. Sometimes that is even a disaster. I mean, this business of bringing leading private sector people into what they call economic management team. Consultation is very important. The best thesis that I have seen about development in Africa comes out of the Aga Khan Foundation Conference of 1985 about the tripartite approach to development, in which is the private sector, public sector, and so-called PDAs or NGO sector collaborating in certain ways where each person's strength works together. But keeping private sector people, what they call economic management team, is sometimes farcical because those who are trying to regulate are the ones making the regulation for themselves. Monopolists are there. How will they talk about? Uh, uh, um, uh, what you, uh, mm, uh, uh, laws that antitrust laws when they are themselves monopolists. So, so there are many things we need to think through beyond the drama of how we set up teams. And, and so there are uh, fundamental issues to work through. But the important thing is the spirit and how people work at it. it doesn't really matter what formula, what nature of the team. If there is real honest commitment. What happened between 57 and 64 will happen again. If it is just show, if the values of the people are not aligned to making Nigeria a great country, it will still amount to a waste of time. Prof, let me, so let me no jump right, in quickly. No wrong. I, Everything is possibly good. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you, uh, and I, I know, mm -hmm. uh, if, I, if I delve into it, I might be touching uh, into a very sensitive part of you uh, when it comes to your economic knowledge. Uh, but I, I, I need, for the sake of our viewers tonight, if you can tell us, maybe, just maybe, we're on the right track. And if this government is doing the right things and touching on the right nerves to agitate or to propel the economy forward, what do you think about the trajectory in which we have begun over the last nine months or so? Um. Show you can approach problems from different perspectives. The people who talk about a big bang approach, the people who think that big bang is destructive, the people who would rather therefore that you progress. Uh, but the big bang can work. And the approach of a modulated engagement can probably even work much better. It all depends on the context and all of that. So um, everything should be given time to, to be seen through, to then evaluate. Uh, I think to rush to prescribe that this was right or this is wrong, uh, I think is not the way to go. Uh, the naked, sad truth is that we are way, way, way behind those that we started out with, those that are, are out ahead of. And for me, fundamentally, at the core of it, is a collapse of culture in Nigeria, our values. i give you a simple example. Look at what Egypt has done under its current president. Uh, I mean, I'm not just talking about the new Cairo, the infrastructure everywhere, the way the power uh, initiative has been managed and all of that. But just look at the number of SUVs that run around you guys in Abuja and the ones that run around in Cairo. I've told the story of arriving in Cairo with a group of senior bank uh, executives in Nigeria who were in the same hotel. They had ordered a, a serious car to take them to the meeting the following day. So that serious car turned out to be something like a Toyota Corolla. And they were very infuriated. And uh, for them in Cairo, hey, that's a serious car. You know, for the Nigerian big man, that is a joke. It has to be a huge SUV to take them. So you get government officials 
squander the wealth of the nation in buying themselves all kinds of fancy imported cars and they've not looked at development and poor people are hungry. Look, Sheo, the problems are too fundamental. It's not about an economic team, it's about elite consciousness to determine what so, really is so, our so country, do when we, do we want to take it. How do we it? get uh, that out? How do we get that working? How do we get that elite consensus? Well, first of I mean, all, you, I know you, you that need, government you need, you need to also drive minded. that conversation. Doesn't it? Is the government really trying to trigger that uh, elite consensus uh, narrative that you are that you portray that you're talking about? It, 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 it starts with the example of the government officials. Again, I keep going back, and please be pardon me on this. I keep going back to General Obasanjo. I gave him a lot of trouble as a young student leader back in the in the seventies, but I'm I'm ever so admiring of him. When I look. When oil prices went down one notch, General Obasanjo, as head of state, declared low profile because her in incomes were down. He said, you know, um, we're going to cut our cloth, uh, cut our, our coats according to our cloth, not according to our size. He came down as head of state to push your 504. Everybody else went below that. But look at the motor case of even legislative leaders in Nigeria. I mean, something has gone so fundamentally wrong with the culture of leadership. Leadership is about sacrifice. It's not about taking the people's... Uh, look at the kinds of... Uh, I'm so glad for Alex Uti and what he has done with the pensions that the former governors gave themselves. We should do that across the board. We draw all these houses they built for themselves. It is free. These men should be in jail for doing these things. To use public resources like that is to show that you don't have conscience. So, Prof, if, if President Tinubu we were to do something that you think will get us in the right direction, what would that be? That's, first of all, getting everybody to say, hey, we're here to serve people, not for our personal uh, 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 convenience and glory. We cut all the frills. We really go to work. And we focus on production. What do we do to create industrial parks, small uh, estates around the country? We we'll bring together young entrepreneurs, sources of financing, and go to work as a country based on our factor endowments across the country. Let us produce and produce our way out of poverty. Look, exchange rates. <laughs> you can play games one way or the other. And exchange rates can go this way, go that way. The only thing that manages to make it happen in the final analysis is how you produce and how you produce what others want from you, usually based on your factor endowments, which give you a latent comparative advantage. Is it latent comparative advantage, uh, comparative advantage that gets translated into ultimately foreign income, foreign reserves? and the strengthening of your exchange rate if that is your big problem. Um, see, I, I just came back from Taiwan. I was driving around this small country of 24 million people, nearly 1.6 million entrepreneurs and SMEs, and exporting like crazy. And I'm asking myself, why? The Gini coefficient in Taiwan, I used to teach with it many years ago in the 50s, a few people had so much money, most people were poor. Today, the Gini index in, in Taiwan is so narrow because everybody's making money, everybody's striving. But elite consciousness in Nigeria is not in that direction. It's how everybody else can look like a, 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 a pauper and a few people live like kings. Mm. That is false consciousness so, pro, that pro, keeps countries down. Yeah. So, so, so you and your yeah. friends are proposing a parliamentary system of government, which you think might be a perfect fit for the Nigeria uh, that we want. Why? Many reasons. Uh, first of all, accountability is so missing in this current arrangement. It's so bad. In a parliamentary system, accountability increases. Uh, first of all, the fact that the people are close to government by the fact that they are direct representatives get to parliament, those direct representatives pick one amongst them to lead them 
and they're constantly being referred to or referring to uh, uh, the people and the problems and the challenges on a daily basis. And if the government is not delivering, if the government can fall today, we have a new government tomorrow. But here, all you have to do is make people poor and take advantage of their poverty, distribute some things to them on election day. For the next four years, nobody asks you any question. You, you know, you behave like a tyrant, you do anything you like. So accountability is one reason why the parliamentary system is a preferred form of government. Two costs. <laughs> to get elected, there's only a small constituency, a home constituency that knows your grandfather, that knows everybody, that knows that in your family, they are, they've been thieves for generations. So who won't vote for that kind of guy. That's the, the family is uh, family of thieves. And so they vote somebody who may be modest, who has no money, who didn't have the money to spread around the country to try and become president. And then that person comes, his colleagues respect his intellect and his capacity, his passion, and they make him leader. And he leads the country. Anytime he feels, the colleagues show him aside and a new person comes up. So a parliamentary form of government is clearly so much more cost effective uh, for a democracy than a presidential type system where you have to run around the entire country. And really seriously, look at our world. Who are the democracies that thrive? What kind of democracies are they? I mean, they're majorly parliamentary democracies and people connect more to parliaments and parliaments can more readily um, have the pressure from the people directly than presidential forms of detached ministers who somebody brings from nowhere and they say, but look, back in the 80s, one of my fun things to do was to go into Nairobi. I had a friend who was a great Kenyan writer, publisher. Uh, I used to write a column in Newsweek magazine back in those days. And we would both sit at the Thumb Tree Cafe of the New Stanley Hotel. And within an hour, all kinds of ministers, MPs would be coming in and out. They would stop, greet this person, greet that person. How many ministers do you see walking around and, and, and having tea in, in bars around the place and people coming and chat with them? Some guy from the street will walk in and say, ah, MP, look, this thing you guys did last week, uh, you, I'm not sure you guys uh, are really considering and walk away. And I used to enjoy watching that. I know how many times I've run into Nigerian ministers sitting in some open cafe in some place in Abuja. In fact, not talk of their constituencies. They've all moved from their constituencies to Abuja. They don't even know what's happening in their constituency. They just use them uh, to collect money, so-called constituency pro pro uh, uh, projects and, and stuff. And democracy is just not working. Yeah, yeah, yeah Professor and That's Tommy, why yeah. perhaps the parliamentary yeah. system will make it better. Yeah, I'm being told I have just about 60 seconds uh, to wrap up now. But I'd like to get your practical mm. take on the, uh, some of the decisions of President Bola Tinubu, uh, and some of the indices of the economy, I will see. And I would like to also put you on the spot, uh, like I always try to do, because I'd like to get you upset so that you can... <laughs> so that you can... <laughs> you can <laughs> yeah. so you know, I'd like to put you on the spot. As you become an old man, <laughs> as you become an old man like I am becoming... <laughs> uh, getting upset is a luxury. <laughs> you know. All right. So I just have less than 60 seconds rest. All right, uh, uh, to, to, to go. Give us an understanding, Prof, whether or not some of the early steps or the immediate steps of this president is in the right direction. What do you think? I mean, the different kinds of steps, some make sense, some you worry about. Uh, clearly, there was a general consensus that the business of subsidy was not desirable, but there was a question about how you deliver on removing it. So making it clear that subsidy was not the way to go was a very reasonable thing to do. And I think there was a fair consensus about doing that, maybe some disagreement on how it was done. Um, I think that uh, there was too much of a rush to please Washington and Paris. Very frankly, I think that that was a downer 
on some of the early policy choices that were made. And that is because of the scramble for some legitimacy. And, and I think that in the end, mm. people are coming down, going past that All right. desperation for the legitimacy. Right. Yeah. Prof, I must sincerely thank you for your thoughts. Uh, you will not get tired. All will, all will not get tired and will not give up on Nigeria. Because it's all our project. You, you don't and as think long I'm, as we're here... I'm, I'm end, I've ended that move to an island in the Caribbean to go and just sit quiet. <laughs> no, 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 and, you will not uh, go. You go and come back. Uh, you are wearing a fedora. You. You're looking like a yeah. Niger Delta man. So you are a Nigerian, <laughs> Patu told me. You go nowhere, Professor Patu told me. I declare right here. <laughs> but thank you so much, Prof. It's a pleasure talking to you. I appreciate your time tonight. Great pleasure. Thank you so much. That's our show for tonight, everyone. Many thanks for watching. I'm Sean Okimaloe. Bye-bye.